Hello, my dear friends, uh, Dr. Rajiv Donair, your ENT faculty with Dr. Wills. Let us discuss the ENT questions asked in INICT November 2023. Uh, number one question was about the anatomy of the middle ear. They asked about the, the joint identification, actually. My dear friends, as we discussed in the app video also in the class also, this is the, you know, of course, the first was malleus, then incus, then stapes. And of course, this joint is the incudomalial joint. And this is a saddle joint actually. Saddle joint, you know, we discussed the middle ear ossicles video also. It is a saddle joint and incudostabilial joint is a ball and socket joint. Okay, and this is the design movement wise actually. But if you ask uh, uh, the design, the nature of the joint, actually all joints in ENT are synovial by, you know, design. Of course, the movement wise, we have to say like incudomalial is the saddle joint and the incudostabilial is ball and socket joint. But by design, all of them are synovial joints. Actually. Like Larry's got two joints, Krico, you know, arytenoid joint and Krico thyroid joint, and they are also synovial. And my dear friend, Krico arytenoid joint of Larry is very, very important. Again, a synovial joint. And this shows the rotatory movement and the gliding movement. And the Krico arytenoid joint of the larynx can be involved in rheumatoid arthritis, which is a disease of synovial joints. So a very beautiful question of anatomy. Incudomalial joint is a saddle joint. And of course, incudostabilial joint is a ball and socket joint. Now, this was again a very expected question. This is multiple times in the class, uh, in the videos also, that if they show you any lesion on the nose skin or the pinna skin, this is, of course, the first diagnosis which should come to your mind should be basal cell carcinoma, BCC, and uh, generally rodent ulcer variety of the BCC. Uh, my dear friends, you know, you we can debate on this that, you know, it can be squamous cell carcinoma or other things. And But you know what, whenever the questions are asked, they ask about the most probable diagnosis. So never ever go for the rarer things. Don't change the answers and all that. And this, this is discussed amply in the videos and the class also that ulcerative lesions with the, you know, typical finding of, you know, rolled out edges, uh, sometimes visible. Please do mark it, you know, basal cell carcinoma, any ulcerative lesion on the nose skin or pinna skin. Okay. Of course, this is the most probable clinical diagnosis and biopsy will be confirmatory, you know, uh, for the proper diagnosis later on. Now, again, the third question, very beautiful, very clinical, very generally discussed question. A patient who has presented with the, you know, episodic vertigo, which is sudden in onset and there is SNHL element also and there is tinnitus, but this is lasting for minutes to hours and there is accompanying nausea, vomiting and some vagal symptom as well. And they've given the audiogram also. My dear friend, first of all, the episodic vertigo, uh, hearing loss, uh, which is SNHL and tinnitus, this is definitely tried of menius disease. Actually, we all know that. And they've given one audiogram also to support the diagnosis further. They, my dear friends, you know, M for menius and M for migraine. Just like migraine, menius is a unilateral disease. And just like migraine, menius is an episodic disease also. Now, unilateral means only one ear is affected. And you can see in this uh, audiogram that, of course, the you know left ear is totally normal because all the thresholds are about 25. But the right ear has got SNHL. And we can see a beautiful rising audiogram over there. So rising audiogram in the Puritan audiometry or uh, unilateral SNHL, this is a typical finding of menius disease, my dear friend. Why it cannot be? BPPV, my dear friends, benign proximal positional vertigo will have pure vertigo along with nausea vomiting, yes, but there will not be any tinnitus or any hearing loss in that case. And of course, BPPV vertigo is a brief spell for few seconds only. Vestibular neuronitis, now this will be again a sudden onset vertigo along with the SNHL and this vertigo persists for days. It's not episodic. It will persist for days, actually, okay? So, uh, vestibular neuronitis, which is viral, you can say, the infection, this would be having the, the sudden onset vertigo with SNHL, but not episodic, not lasting for a few minutes or few hours, actually. So, for a few seconds, uh, vertigo is BPPV. For a few hours, BPPV is, uh, for a few hours, vertigo is the mean years. And for a few days, think about the, you know, vestibular neuronitis over there, actually. Okay, the answer to this question is, of course, menius disease, A. Beautiful question, clinical question, and the rising audiogram uh, and unilateral SNHL. This is typical, you know, of SNH uh, pattern, pattern of the menius disease, actually. And I think it's amply discussed, and INSTD was kinder this time in ENT, I would say. Now, again, the audiology is a favorite domain of INICT. 
they asked about a patient who presents to OPD with bilateral hearing loss, which is worse on the right side. So right is a poor ear here. They said that the worse is the right side. So right is a poor ear. Now, the patient was diagnosed eventually uh, with the autosclerosis and the surgeon is planning surgery with stepidectomy. And, you know, they're asking you, what are tuning folk finding? My dear friends, autosclerosis means what? Guys, stapes is a piston. If the piston gets fixed, it's autosclerosis. And any disease of external ear and middle ear will cause conductive hearing loss. So in conductive hearing loss, if you see Rene and Weber finding, please see over here, in conductive hearing loss, Rene is negative. And the Weber is heard in the poor ear. So autosclerosis is a classical example of conductive hearing loss due to fixation of stapes would be giving negative Rene on the you know, affected side. And of course, there will be Weber lateralized to the poor ear. And we do remember in this case, right is a poor ear because patient has been having more problem on the right side. So my dear friend, first of all, let's say A is not possible because Rene cannot be positive. Okay, and again, B cannot be there because Rene cannot be positive over there. So either C or D. My dear friends, Rene has to be negative. Of course, and the Weber has to lateralize to the right ear, which is the poor ear, which is the poor ear. So answer is D in this case. In conductive hearing loss, in autosclerosis, Rene will be negative, means BC is more than AC. And Weber is lateralized to the right ear, which is a poor ear in this case. The answer to this question is D. Do you remember? Audiology is a very favorite domain of, you know, INICT always. And do remember this thing, of course, discussed in the app videos also. Now, this was a little, you know, you can say lateral, you know, I always say that there, there's some type B question over there. Uh, and the patient has got, you know, you know, like presentation in the OPD with hearing loss. And he explains to the doctor that I can only understand when somebody shouts to make me, you know, hear that sound or amplified speech can be heard. Now, this was actually a little, I would say, lateral, you know, question over there. And they asked about the as per WHO classification. Uh, uh, let us see the WHO classification actually over there. There's, you know, up to 25 is normal, of course, you know. When we say, you know, 26 to 40, we call it mild hearing loss or slight hearing loss. We can say that, you know, the patient would be saying that, uh, Dr. Dhawan, I can hear the, you know, uh, you know, any word being said by someone who's standing at one meter, one meter. But if it goes beyond that, it will be difficult for me. So, so he can understand, repeat the word very correctly for any, you know, voice coming in the, in the one meter zone. So that's, that's pretty okay. Means not much of a problem in the general conversation over there. Now, when it is 41 to 60, it's moderate. The first one is mild is 26 to 40. Moderate is 40, 41 to 60. Now, when you say moderate means, you know, yeah, uh, you can say that patient has to have, you know, some amount of little bit raised voice over there. And uh, again, from one meter, but somebody has to raise the voice a little bit actually over there. That's a vague kind of description by the patient. And that is the moderate. But then when we say that somebody has to shout to make me understand, then we talk about the severe problem or severe hearing loss. And this falls in 61 to 80 decibel of the, you know, like uh, hearing loss pattern. And more than, you know, 80 or 81 or above would be profound. Means you, even if you shout at the person, patient has got no understanding of speech, not no hearing, that's a profound deafness over there, profound hearing loss over there. So the, in this case, person is able to hear sounds when somebody is shouting, actually, to help you understand or hear. So it's a severe kind of loss. So this, this is the answer over there. Why it's not profound? Profound means that uh, even if somebody is shouting, you can't understand anything. So, uh, you know, mild means that, you know, normal conversation can be heard at one meter distance even. That's okay. And uh, the other one is slightly somebody has to raise the voice to make you understand. That's moderate. But somebody has to shout to make you understand. It is severe. But even if somebody is shouting, you don't understand anything that is profound hearing loss. This is a little vague description of the, you can say the hearing loss. You know, up to 25 is normal. Again, we see 26 to 40 decibel is mild. 41 to 60 is moderate. 61 to 80 decibel is severe. And more than, you know, 81 or above is the profound hearing loss. The answer to the question is severe. Again, a repeat question, a patient presents to OPD with complaints of bleeding from the nose, nasal obstruction, difficulty in breathing. 
he has the history of bathing in the you know pond over there. Can you understand over there? There's a history of bathing in the pond over there. There's a nasal mask, which is red polypodal mask with whitish dots on it. It's a little irregular surface, actually. And biopsy is showing over there beautifully. And of course, everybody knows that it's a rhinosporidiosis. The most probable diagnosis is rhinosporidiosis. Last time they gave a history that patient is a farmer or a cattle breeder, and he's residing in the coastal uh, village of South India, basically Tamil Nadu. And the patient has been having the visits to the pond uh, in between. So the same pond is true over there because rhinosporidium cebrae, uh, the one thing you're seeing on the biopsy also, this is an aquatic protozoa found in the pond water. And this pond water is being used by cows, buffaloes also. And humans share that uh, pond for either bathing or swimming or whatever. And the most common lesion would be in the nose, but yes, oral cavity, conjunctiva, genital areas can be affected. The classical appearance is the mulberry-like or strawberry-like nasal mass with epistaxis. When we say mulberry or strawberry-like, this is a pinkish red or reddish mass which is firm to palpate. And on examination, it has got irregular studded surface. And that's the classical thing like mulberry or strawberry-like nasal mass. And this mass will be a little bit bleeding also when you touch it. So this is a classical case of, you know, uh, the rhinosporidiosis. You can ask me, Rajiv, why it is not inverted papilloma or ringed's tumor? My dear friends, why would inverted papilloma will have any kind of history of visit to the ponds over there, number one? Number two, the mass description. The nasal mass in inverted papilloma is, of course, pinkish red or reddish. And it is firm. Yes, agreed, same thing. But this has classically got the smooth surface. My dear friend, please compare this smooth surface, firm pinkish red nasal mass of inverted papilloma which is also called ringed's tumor, as compared to this rhinosporidosis mass, which has got irregular studded surface over there. So that's the classical difference between these two things. And you can ask me, Rajiv, why it is not angiofibroma? My dear friend, again, angiofibroma classically will be a young adolescent male, 12 to 16 year of male. And then, of course, nasal mass is there. But the classical word is profuse epistaxis. That's not there. Cool. And rhinosporoma is totally different disease which is woody nose, a lot of granulometers changes in the skin of the nose, along with crusting and the bad smell from the nose. Beautiful question, repeat question. Okay, now. Now, again, inner ear always gets one or two question uh, in NICT, you know, like last time they asked for altery pathway. This time they went for the, the organ of corti in the inner ear. If you look at the workbooks we had for the, you know, classes, you can see the organ of corti image there. In organ of corti, we have got two types of hair cells, the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. My dear friend, outer and inner. Let's, you know, revise it quickly. The outer hair cells are arranged in three layers and they are cylindrical and they are controlling or modulating the function of the inner hair cells. So one thing you say, they're more, you know, efferent actually. Okay. And you can say the, the inner hair cells now. Inner hair cells are arranged in the single layer. Please see on the screen. This is, of course, the outer hair cell arranged in the three layers. And they're more cylindrical. And they're modulating the function of the inner hair cells. And this is the inner hair cell, which are you seeing in the single layer over there. And they are flask-shaped. They are less in number. Approximate ratio of outer or inner is three is to one. Outer are three times more than the inner. Of course, outer are having three layers over there. And in outer are cylindrical in a flask shape. Outer are modulating the function of the inner hair cell. And inner hair cells are the main efferent cells which are generating the action potentials in the fibers of the cochlear nerve over there. Now, let us look at the, the choices given. Number one, the first one is inner hair cells are in single row and transmit auditory impulses. That's absolutely correct statement. Single row, and they are the one which generate the impulses or the electrical action potential in the fiber of the eight nerve, number one. Number two, outer hair cells are three to four in number, rows, yes, and they modulate the function of inner hair cells. So first is correct. Second is also correct over there, okay? The third one, outer hair cells are more responsible for the movement of tectorial membrane, wrong. This is wrong, my dear friends. The tectorial membrane covers the organ of corti. When the sound energy comes, it moves the basilar membrane and that moves the organ of corti. 
and when organ of corti inner hair cells are shearing against the pectoral membrane they generate action potential so basically you can say the inner hair cells are mainly responsible for the movement of pectoral membrane which is covering the organ of corti now third, fourth one inner hair cells are in single row correct and they modulate the function of inner hair cells wrong outer hair cells are modulating the function of inner hair cells actually inner hair cells are mainly afferent uh, they generate the action potential the eighth one and lastly outer is to inner is 3 is to 1 i think this is correct statement so first is correct okay second is correct and fifth is correct okay fifth is correct now look at the choices with the so guys look at the first choice the first second and fifth are correct so a is the correct answer let's quickly revise outer hair cells are more in number three times more than the inner hair cells and outer hair cells are cylindrical inner are flask shaped outer hair cells modulate the function of inner hair cell but inner hair cells are the main cells to generate the action potential in the fiber of the eight now now next question again clinical story based question and again a repeat topic but they went to microbiological finding they said that a 50 year old diabetic patient admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 again. Okay, two things over there. And the lung involvement was there. So somebody advised methylprednisolone, the risk of steroids. So three risk factors for mucormycosis in front of you, actually. Patient was admitted back to the hospital, as happened in the last time when the Delta strain was there. People came back after getting discharged for COVID-19 after a few days. There was a nasal blockage. There was a facial swelling. You know, cheek got maxillary sinus got involved, there was a redness over cheek, cheek swelling over there, and the eye involvement over there, orbital swelling also. Now, the debridement was performed, as you know, the mucormycosis has got a lot of ischemic necrosis because mucormycosis or mucor is angio-invasive fungus, and that glow grows into the blood vessels, and that causes ischemia necrosis, actually. That's a blackish color over there, and they said that the nasal biopsy showed wide hyphae without septa as shown in the given slide. Let me tell you, Vache, now this kind of you know clinical picture, if you ask me at the postgraduate level, there can be possibility of aspergillosis also. Let's not be really too biased towards the mucormycosis because you know aspergillus can also be one of the contaminant you know pathogens in this particular scenario over there. But they are asking you that they the bi microbiological finding is showing the wide hyphae over there without septic. Okay. Now, my dear friends, please see. Now, this wide hyphae without septic, this is in favor of, again, mucormycosis. Now, if you ask me to differentiate, you must have done in microbiology also. This is a beautiful integration of, you know, ENT with microbiology. My dear friends, if you look at the aspergillosis, the aspergillosis has got a thinner hyphae and mucormycosis has got wider hyphae. Now, aspergillosis has got septations in the hyphae, but mucormycosis, mucor has got no septations in the hyphae. Third thing is, the aspergillus classically branches at 45 degree. And mucormycosis, even if it branches, it's at 90 degree. Let's revise. The aspergillus would have been thinner hyphae, septate hyphae, and the, the, the division or the branching would have been at 45 degree angle. In mucormycosis is a thicker hyphae without septations. And even if they have got branching, it's at 90 degree. Okay. Now, this question says that the wider hyphae are there and without septa over there. So that's why mucor is a very logical, you know, answer over there. But, you know, question also was very much descriptive. But however, there's a learning from the microbiological angle over there that division, the differentiation of aspergillus from mucor depending on the sample received. Again, this question, again, debatable, because the recall is always having, you know, uh, some sort of uh, possibility that whether this question exactly came there like this or not. But whatever recall we got, actually, there's a disclaimer there that there may be certain corrections, which is a human error. We accept that, okay? But we try to collect as many questions as possible so that you get the fair idea what they're asking. Now, they say there's a virus which has got special affinity for the stratified squamous, you know, epithelium, the mucosal, which part is likely to get affected? So look at, the, look at the histology being asked, you know, you know, laterally through virology, actually, in the ENT domain, actually. Guys, please understand, the vocal cords are lined by 
you know, stratified or pseudo stratified squamous epithelium. So, you know, there's, a, there's a debate on stratified or pseudo stratified, but it is stratified actually. Some people say it's pseudo stratified, some is stratified. But if you think about the respiratory epithelium, the, the remaining part of larynx, the trachea, bronchi, they are lined by ciliated columnar epithelium, or you can say pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. There has to be cilia over there. This virus has got a particular affinity for the stratified squamous epithelium. The best answer would be vocal cord because in these three, there will be ciliated columnar epithelium, maybe pseudo stratified written over. Okay. So, see, the, this is what beauty, beauty of the uh, NEAT PG NSD is that they take you from one topic to another. That's what integration is actually. Okay. But if you know vocal cord are not lined by ciliated columnar epithelium because we discuss amply in the class. The whole larynx is pink in color except vocal cords. That is said that the larynx is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium except vocal cord, which are lined by stratified squamous or pseudo stratified squamous epithelium over there. So, answer this best answer is A. Now, in the, the last question, uh, radiology and ENT uh, overlap. Child has a history of swallowing a foreign body and they have given you X ray. And they wanted to comment on is it a coin or a battery or a marble or a plastic piece, my dear friend. Because actually, they want to ask this, you know, double ring sign over there, which you discussed amply in the class that, you know, coin versus battery. The battery will always have, you know, two rims over there. And that's why in X ray also you're seeing the double rim over there. So the answer to this question is the disc battery. And you know, disc battery in esophagus or cricopharyngeal area is an emergency situation. Do not postpone the procedure. You should do urgent esophagoscopy and remove it because there is a risk of release of alkali, which can cause esophageal perforation in this case. So, my dear friend, these were the questions asked in INICT, in ENT, in November 2023 examination. This is a recall, my dear friends. We do, uh, you know, have a disclaimer over here that there may be certain choices or certain questions, you know, framed by us would not be exactly simulating the the things asked in the paper because of, you know, human error possible. We try to collect it as many questions as possible with as many choices. And then we try to give you a broad idea that what were the topics asked. And, and you would agree with me, this time INICT, ENT was really kinder as compared to the, you know, you know, other subject in the previous session also. Thank you very much. Keep learning.